Okay, good. Um, I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers of the Netherlands Research Integrity Network, uh, Lex in particular, as well as Doreen and Lara, who have done a tremendous job so far. So uh, thank you so much for organizing this uh, event. The um, previous talk was on replication, as we all noted. Um, I'm going to talk about replication as well, but also on something a little broader, namely whether there can be progress in the humanities. So it's a little broader than that. Uh, final thing I wanted to say before I get started, uh, I realize it's the final talk of the day and people might be a little tired, so I'll do my best to make some really controversial claims so that everybody stay, uh, stays awake, yet uh, that I also believe are true, so both controversial and true. All right, um, progress in the humanities. Can there be progress in the humanities? Um, a few quick words. Uh, what do I take the humanities to be? Uh, you can have a whole debate about what the humanities are and what the boundaries are. I just take it to be those academic disciplines like archaeology, classics, history, linguistics, literary studies, philosophy, theology. So roughly those with some vague boundaries. I think that will do for today. Um, when I talk about progress, I will start with an initial definition widely shared that I will later on re correct and redefine. Um, roughly, many people take progress to be ever more knowledge and understanding and also ever more agreement, so growing consensus. The humanities are in crisis nowadays, at least that is what many people believe and many people say also in uh, media outlets. And one of the core worries there is that there is no progress in the humanities. Uh, to give a few examples, here is here's a quote from a humanities special issue. One of the key issues, it says, which have faced the humanities throughout time, simply pertains to the justification, legitimate, legitimation, and hence acceptance in the canon of subjects at the academy. Um, so the very justification is that issue. And nobody asks that question about, for instance, physics or, or cosmology or biology. But apparently the humanities have to justify themselves. Um, even stronger is Justin Stover in the Chronicle of Higher Education. The humanities are not just dying, they're almost dead. All right, that's a rather bold statement. Um, what is the problem here? And exactly what are the arguments behind the claim that there's no progress in the humanities? I think a few can be distinguished. Uh, first, some people say that no knowledge can be had in the humanities. Here's Alex Rosenberg, a philosopher from uh, Duke University. He says, when it comes to real understanding, the humanities are nothing we have to take seriously except as symptoms, but they're everything we need to take seriously when it comes to entertainment, enjoyment, and psychological satisfaction. Just don't treat them as knowledge or wisdom. Now here's Alex Rosenberg. Now, what is it? The background here is some sort of scientism, so a theory that allows only the results of the natural sciences to count as knowledge. Um, we can talk about this a little more, but... Um, what I would like to say here is that I've addressed together with a few colleagues this epistemological theory in detail elsewhere, and I think it's been widely criticized. So that would not be a good backup for the claim that there's no progress in the humanities. Um, a second argument says that uh, when it comes to the humanities, there's so much nonsensical stuff, or bullshit, to put it a little less politely. Um, a well-known example is the grievance studies affair, by, uh, which was carried out by Peter Bogossian, James Lindsay, and Helen Pluckrose. And um, their idea was that in various fields like gender studies and race studies, queer studies, fat studies, uh, people put social grievances ahead of truth. And what they did is that they submitted a bunch of papers that they made up themselves. They were pretty much nonsense. Some of them were accepted and published, others under review, still others forthcoming, a few others uh, rejected. And they uh, took this to mean that some fields are just rubbish, they're just nonsense. Here they are. Um, so those are the fields involved. And actually, they took this to have wider repercussions on postmodernism and critical theory more generally. Now, there's a whole lot to be said about this. It, would, it was also criticized for purely scientific reasons, for instance, there being no control group. But the main thing I want to say today is that this would apply most to a couple of rather limited fields within the humanities. So it wouldn't apply to mainstream history or philosophy or ling linguistics and so on. So that doesn't provide a solid argument either. Um, it doesn't imply that much about progress in the humanities in general. Here's a third argument. Some people say that science has taken over from the humanities. Here's uh, Stephen Hawking. He famously said about philosophy, philosophy is dead and scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. All right, so again, another claim about this, something is being dead, philosophy in this, in this particular case. Well, briefly, this is just false for most philosophy. Um, Philosophy is alive and kicking in many fields, for instance, in research integrity, but also in the philosophy of biology or the philosophy of mathematics in the neurosciences nowadays. 
Um, and also, it seems to me to be utterly uninformed about recent developments like um, modal logic or uh, Bayesianism or reflective equilibrium in ethics. So, so much has been going on. It seems that Stephen Hawking, dis despite his enormous achievements, was just badly informed on this point. All right, so not a good argument either. Do we have anything by way of good argument? I think there are two somewhat more plausible points to be made. Um, some people might say, well, studies in the humanities cannot be replicated. They don't lend themselves for, for replication. And another claim is that there's no growing consensus in the humanities. I mean, humanities have been going on for ages, and still there is so much disagreement in opposition to fields like physics, where people seem to somewhat converge in their opinions. So what I will do in the remainder of this talk is explore these two uh, arguments. All right, so starting with replication in the humanities. Um, what do, I mean, what do I mean by the key words? Well, replicability is roughly a study is having certain features such that a replication of it can in principle be carried out, whether or not that is actually done, such as being fairly transparent about the methodology. Um, second, a replication study is a study of um, uh, an early, uh, I'm sorry, a rep replication study is a study that is an independent repetition of an earlier published study, usually, not always actually, um, using sufficiently similar methods and conducted under sufficiently similar circumstances. And a success successful replication is, of course, one that has roughly the same results as the original study or that agree with the results of the original study. So again, if there is one, so there need not be one because there can be unintentional replications. So re re replication studies that are not set up as replication studies, right? So they just happen to treat the same question, sometimes even with the same data. Uh, three kinds of replication, uh, reproduction, direct replication, conceptual replication. That was already covered by Peter, so I'm not going to repeat uh, that distinction. What I want to say is that this applies, the whole issue of replication applies only to what I take to be the empirical humanities. So it doesn't really apply to fields like logic, for instance, or metaphysics, or epistemology, or ethics, or metaethics, because those fields are largely... Uh, deductive in their methods. So they don't work with data, or at least not, not the same sort of data as, for instance, history or uh, linguistics work, work with. Um, all right, well, what does a paradigmatic replication look like? Well, in fields like biomedicine, for instance, or social psychology, you usually have a team of independent researchers, could also be partly the same, but usually independent. Um, very often they gather new data, they follow the original protocol or sometimes a slightly revised or even somewhat new protocol. And um, they explain the similarity or the differences if they can between the primary or original study and the replication study. This is some sort of standard stereotypical case of replication. But as, a, as Peter pointed out, it comes in many varieties. Well, if that is correct, I think we can to provide two sorts of arguments for the idea that replication is both possible and desirable in, at least in the empirical humanities. So let's start with a conceptual or a prior argument. And by that, I mean, it just relies on concepts. So it doesn't rely on any empirical research. The idea is if you understand or grasp the notions of replicability and what humanities do, after some reflection, you will just see straight away that replication is possible and desirable in the humanities. All right. Um, how does it run? Well, first, you can just carry out a study to test the results of an original study. So you can test a historical claim, for instance, that was made, or a linguistic claim. Um, you could do so in order to increase the likelihood of the original results. So if you come to the same conclusion, again, with the same data or the new data, with the same protocol or a slightly revised one, then it becomes more likely, Gatris Paribus, that the original results were correct or close to the truth or something like that. Um, you, can, you can form a, a team of independent researchers or a joint team. You can use the same data, you can use new data, as found in text, for instance, or material objects, and you can follow the original protocol or revised protocol. Right? Um, if you do so, then, um, and, and you also explain the similarity with the primary study on the one hand and the replication study on the other, um, then you just follow the steps of a replication study. And all, the, all these steps seem quite possible and feasible and also desirable because you increase the likelihood of the original results in the humanities as well. 
So without any empirical study, I think you can see the value of replication in the humanities. Now, not all of you might be convinced by this, so just to make sure, I've also uh, pr provided a, a short inductive argument. And here the idea is, um, you can just look at cases and see the value of replication in the humanities. So for instance, and I think Peter was quite right about this, to point out that a lot of people have already, have already actually been doing replications in the humanities, even if they didn't call those studies replication studies. Um, so they were unintentional in a certain way. Um, Augustine was influenced by Gnosticism, yet he distanced himself from Gnosticism as well. This has been replicated time and time again by, by various scholars. Um, there are hieroglyphics on the Rosetta Stone, but there are also um, other languages on the Rosetta Stone, like ancient uh, Greek. And those two other languages were used to decipher um, hieroglyphs. And um, that has been done multiple times, leading to the same results. Here's the Rosetta Stone. Um, not too long ago, um, a Van Gogh was discovered, or it was thought to be a Van Gogh, and at some point it was more or less established that it was the sunset at Montmajor, that it was an authentic Van Gogh. But of course, you can use multiple methods to get to that conclusion. So you could um, do an X-ray on the painting, you could analyze the, the style of the painting, you could study the diaries of Van Gogh, you could um, try to identify the provenance, so who owned the painting and who owned the painting prior to that, and so on, all the way back to the original painter. Um, so that, is, that has been done multiple times and has been established. My colleague in the linguistic department has, has done various uh, intentional replication studies. And we ourselves at the, at the FU in, the, in our project on progress in, in the university and also in the humanities will try to carry out two replication studies, one in the science and religion debate, more of a historical one, and one in the Rembrandt Research Project, which aims to verify the authenticity of various paintings, allegedly by Rembrandt. So uh, this inductive case shows that um, replication is not only possible, but also quite desirable uh, in multiple fields in humanities. All right, um, a bit more about the, the desirability issue. Um, exactly why is it reliable, uh, desirable to carry out replication studies in the humanities? Here I would like to give eight reasons, so uh, quite a few actually. First, I think it would increase the likelihood of the original results. So the more often you come to the original results on the same data or, or partly on the basis of other data, the more likely it becomes that, that the original results are correct and the more trustworthy they become. Uh, second, you can, by trying to replicate, you can test the replicability of the original study in the first place. So to what extent does it, does it lend itself to replication? Is it sufficiently transparent or explicit about the methodology uh, being used or about the data set being used and so on? You can filter out faulty reasoning. We can all uh, accidentally, or maybe even purposely, engage in faulty reasoning. Um, you can draw out uh, attention to unnoticed crucial differences in study methods. Uh, that were being used. Uh, you can bring new or old uh, forgotten evidence to mind. You can provide new background knowledge from other fields, for instance, or uh, recent developments. You can uh, detect the use of flawed research methods. Um, and finally, in doing all this, and by time and again coming to, hopefully, uh, to similar submission, these similar conclusions, you can either increase or regain the public trust in the humanities. And, as I said earlier, there's been quite a crisis in the humanities. So I think this is one of the things that could regain public trust in the humanities. Now, uh, we've all heard Peter Stock, and he was slightly optimistic about the idea of replication in the humanities, but also a little worried. So I would like to address a couple of worries that one could level at this stage. Um, first, some people say the humanities work with unique objects, like, for instance, the novel, to the, the splendid novel, To the Lighthouse by, by Virginia Woolf. Whereas if you work with atoms or uh, diseases, you can just study multiple instances. Um, my reply briefly is that this objection doesn't work because the issue is really not whether the object is unique, but whether you can gather new data about that object. So even if an object is unique, you can carry out replication studies on it. For instance, space-time itself might very well be unique, as far as we know. But you can gather new data about it time and again. So, um, and the same is true for the novel um, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Some people are worried about, second, um, about issues regarding meaning and interpretation. But I think that would be a legitimate worry only if there were no 
truths about and falsehoods as well about meaning and interpretation. So I think, I mean, hermeneutics is an entire field that has been developed in order to give us rules and ideas about how to interpret texts. So, and there are correct ways and incorrect ways to do so. Uh, sometimes there might, the background hermeneutical assumptions might just be too big. Um, and actually a replication study could draw attention to that, right? So there is success or the failure to successfully replicate a study would um, be valuable because it could show that there's just too much disagreement in background assumptions. All right, um, third, one might think that there are different schools of thought in many uh, fields in the humanities. And I think that is quite right, but actually the same is true for lots of fields within the natural sciences, for instance, or the biomedical sciences. Um, so um, that might pose a problem for applicability, but in that case, I think it's just helpful to make explicit what the relevant assumptions of the school are and why that will provide certain limits to the possibility of replication. Um, some people are worried about the role of the scholar, the connoisseurship, and I agree that might be a worry, but I think one of the very, so if you look, for instance, at the um, Rembrandt Research Project, there the idea was um, that people used to identify what is an authentic Rembrandt and what is not on the basis of intuition and connoisseurship. And one of the things that Rembrandt, uh, that uh, Ernst von der Wetering tried to do in the Rembrandt Research Project was come up with somewhat more objective guidelines as how to establish whether something is a, is a true Rembrandt. And he's, he's been quite successful at that. Um, some people are worried about the multitude of methods that we find in the humanities. Uh, so literary analysis, historical analysis, conceptual analysis, and so on. And I think that uh, they are right there. There is a multitude of methods, but there are at least as many methods in the natural sciences and the social sciences. So that doesn't worry me either. Um, so I don't think the main objections that we find in the field are, are convincing. And if you want to look at, at those, not entirely convincing, I take it to be an uh, objection. You can look, look up the work of Bart Bender, Sarah Dereich, and Britt Holbrook on this. All right, so I, what I would say is this, just do it, go ahead. Uh, Peter also suggested it, just try, try it out and see what follows from it. I would say in doing so though, balance it with original research. So try to strike the right balance between original research and replication studies. It's true, we don't talk about a replication crisis in the humanities, but so what? Should we wait for a replication crisis in order to, to start doing replication studies? I think there's value to them, um, uh, even if there is no talk about a replication crisis. And there's talk about a crisis in any case. All right, um, there is a certain risk, of course, because it might actually show that some fields within the humanities are in trouble. Um, so in this way, it might be, um, it might be compared to the, what's been going on with the National Survey on Research Integrity. Some universities did not want to participate in it because they were afraid of the repercussions. Um, but I think as academics, we should be concerned with the truth and improving what we are doing. So uh, let's just keep that in mind. Replication, uh, this is maybe helpful to stress, is a valuable thing, but it is um, one among many virtues. So explanatory power, predictive power, explanatory scope, and so on. They are all um, the virtues to keep in mind, and we should balance replication with those other virtues. Here they are, the virtues. I would say zoom in on cornerstone studies, um, because a lot of research depends on them, and try to get journals, faculty boards, universities, funding agencies, and others to take action. All right, is this all? No, I think there's more. Uh, possible by way of progress. Um, and that is needed, I think, to draw our attention to because there are also the deductive humanities where you can't do replication, at least not in the way you can in the empirical humanities. Are there other ways of progress in the humanities? Yes, I certainly think so. Um, for instance, it is progress if more people come to believe the truth. And um, one way of believing more truths is having more theories out there. And Philosophy, for instance, has been quite fruitful in this regard. There are ever more theories, um, especially in the 20th century, that had not even been developed uh, earlier on. It's also progress if fewer people believe falsehoods. And it's actually the case that in the humanities, many theories are ruled out in the course of time. So here are a couple of examples. The theory um, of the Milanesian school of philosophy in ancient Greece, that everything consists of water. This has been ruled out. But also more philosophical ideas, like the idea that animals don't feel pain or Plato's ideas that 
what we know about um, mathematics, for instance, or arith arithmetic is some sort of memory from um, a state, a prenatal state that we were in before we were born. Um, or solipsism, the idea that you are the only conscious entity in, in the world. So falsehoods are actually ruled out. New tools are being developed. I already mentioned, already mentioned modal logic, deontic logic, possible world semantics, Bayesian epistemology, and, and so on. Um, there's even growing consensus on some issues without a replication. For instance, the idea that knowledge is more than justified true belief. Um, and there are ever more relevant questions, concepts, and distinctions being made. Nowadays, for instance, in social epistemology, where people ask questions about group belief, about disagreement, about polarization. So all sorts of society be relevant issues nowadays. And finally, there's increasing multiple disciplinarity. And that's another way for the humanities to make progress. For instance, when it comes to the relation between ethics and evolutionary theory and evolutionary uh, biology in particular. Um, all right, finally, some uh, recommendations and, uh, and then I'll um, wrap up. When it comes to progress in the humanities, don't be obsessed with consensus. Consensus is valuable, but there are more ways to make progress. Also, don't overlook it either. So people in the humanities are maybe too quick to concede that there is no progress in the humanities. I think there is progress and demonstrably so. Moreover, take replication seriously for all empirical studies in the humanities. Zoom in on cornerstone studies, as I said. But do not positivistically make it the sole criterion for distinguishing science from pseudoscience. There are other intellectual virtues, as, as I said. So try to balance these virtues. So the fact that you don't succeed in um, replicating a study is not a sufficient reason to discard the original study. And finally, pay attention to the manifold ways in which progress in the humanities is possible. I thank you very much for your attention. If you want to look up uh, more on the, on the um, project that I'm currently involved in, as is Lex and, and Yuri and a couple of others, you can find it online by, uh, by searching for the epistemic progress in the university. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>